Wow. Okay, who here wants to watch that again? <laughs> because I that's the first time I watched that all the way through. And that was so cool. I we might want to play that again at the end, Diane. Holy crap, that is so cool. You guys, welcome, welcome, welcome to the legendary Quantum Leap Experience Millionaire Interview Series. My name is Tommy Collier. I'm your moderator for this show. And I'm well, I'm so happy to welcome you today to this extra special incredibly fabulous interview that we have going on today. Diane and I just learned before this call started that this man, Nelson Coates, is responsible for over $2.2 billion of film industry revenue from the movies that he's worked on. And you just got to see a load of eye candy of just a fraction of what he's created in his amazing career. So I am personally so excited to hear this interview. Um, and I think you should be too. And I know Diane is stoked. And so is Nelson. So this is going to be such a good, such a good um, hour together. Now, listen, we could probably sit here and listen to Nelson talk and tell stories for hours and hours, possibly days, but we have an hour together. So I can't promise you that we're going to have time to open up for questions. But if we, if we, um, if we have time, we will. So if you're, if you think of questions as we go, put them in the chat, write them down. Um, and we'll try to get to them, but no promises, okay? So without further ado, I am going to go ahead and hand this over to the woman of the hour and the man of the hour, Diane Armitage and Mr. Nelson Coates. Um, Diane, Nelson, hello. Hi, guys. Hello. hello. <laughs> well, hello, everybody, and welcome, and welcome to 2022. 2022. Absolutely amazing year we're going to have ahead of us. I know we are, and it's starting out beautifully with the most creative mind I really believe I've ever met on this planet. I've known Nelson for, I don't know, 10, 12 years. I don't know how long it's been, but I tell you, every time I see Nelson, it's all these amazing stories and he's all over the world and he's doing all this amazing stuff. And I honestly just want you to meet him because it is a perfect boost to get you really motivated and moving into your 2022 with unlimited creativity 
and power in that mind of yours. So without further ado, I want you to meet Nelson Coates. Hi there. How are you all? Thank you all for coming today. Yes, yes. Okay, so where are you right now? Uh, designing uh, for Disney Hocus Pocus 2 with Bette Midler, Sarah Jessica Parker, and Kathleen and Jimmy. Okay, now Hocus Pocus 2 is kind of a little off your beaten track. So why did you want to do Hocus Pocus 2? Well, uh, the director, Ann Fletcher, and I have done three other features together. The Proposal with Sandra Bullock and Ryan Reynolds, which you may know, and um, The Guilt Trip, Barbra Streisand and Seth Rogen, and a movie called Hot Pursuit with Sofia Vergara and Reese Witherspoon. And so when Ann calls, you know it's going to be a bunch of fun and it's going to be crazy and have some sort of uh, wonderful design challenge. And so I said yes. Um, so uh, it has been very challenging and uh, it's uh, uh, pretty cold here right now. And so that's adding another challenge, but it's all great. And how is Bette Midler? She is surprisingly all business until camera comes on. Uh, but, you know, uh, the other day she got a Kennedy Center honor, which we worked around and all this. And she was back the next week filming. And she came over and gave me a hug and said, you know, it's a pleasure and an honor to be working on your sets. So that kind of made my year. So that is awesome. OK, so if you were to that's so cool, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to tell people what you do, because I try to explain to people and I just kind of go on and on and on. If you were to say in a sentence what you do, what is it that you do? I, my title is called production designer. I only answer to the producer and director. I'm in charge of the concept and the execution of the sets, props, costumes, hair, makeup, special effects, stunt rigs, vehicles, creature effects, computer graphics, color palette, the back history of the characters, basically everything you see in a uh, filmed entertainment uh, that tells the story. Anything you're watching, uh, I've had a hand in and goes through my eyes before uh, it actually hits the screen. Okay, that's a perfect excerpt. I, I, that's, a, that's amazing because when you hear the word production designer, you're like, oh, what's that? <laughs> oh, you know, we don't really know what that is, but you really are the concept of the entire film. And that's what's so amazing about what you do. So I know that way, 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 way back when you were living in Texas and you were in like high school, you were designing stage stages for theater. What, what, how, how did you get into this passion of yours? Well, I guess a little uh, nugget of uh, what this career was uh, started when I was six. My family uh, lived in Knoxville, Tennessee, and we would go to the Smoky Mountains and there's a big loop called Cades Cove. And it's a 11 mile loop that we would bike our bikes around. And one particular trip, there's a lot of old settlers homes around it. And on one particular trip, the um, Cade mill that was halfway through had um, looked bigger than we remembered it. And as we got close, there was snow around it and it wasn't uh, uh, snowing anywhere. So uh, as we got close, got off our bikes, went around the back and they'd added an extension on for a movie that was filming there called A Walk in the Spring Rain with Albert Finney uh, and uh, Ingrid Bergman. And um, so uh, that was my first movie set to be on. And the first time I realized that, wait, the, the, everything isn't real. And then within the same like month, uh, my folks took us to see Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And um, that just kind of blew my mind. And it was like, wow. I get it. This isn't real because someone had to come up with all of that. And uh, the legendary uh, British designer Ken Adam did that movie. And I later got to meet him uh, in life. And um, it uh, served as a catalyst for at least being aware of this. But back then, you didn't have magazines. You didn't have Entertainment Tonight or Entertainment Weekly. You didn't know how to go there and how to get there. So uh, with families in education, uh, my parents, both university professors, uh, we didn't know anyone in the entertainment business other than in theater. So I started acting professionally at six, uh, my first uh, professional theater role. And um, over time, uh, as I was doing shows, uh, I would notice how people had designed the work or if I had, had, had built it, you know, you're, you're trying to do the best with the materials you have. And finally, I was in a uh, show at an equity theater and the set was not good. And I opened my mouth and said, I could do better than this. And they said, oh, great. The next show is yours. We don't have a designer for it. So that show, I built it, painted it, uh, did uh, all the set dressing for it. 
uh, and it started getting uh, notice and awards. Um, and so each successive project got a little bit more and more involved. Uh, but that's theater. So and saw my um, designs at the Dallas Theater Center and asked me to uh, design a pilot for a television series. And that uh, series, uh, they were going to pitch to PBS. And for those of you who have not heard the word pilot before, it's usually like the first episode of a series. They see if the cast is working, if the uh, sets work, if the storylines work, and if it's something they want to invest in and go to series with. So that uh, show did indeed get picked up. I made all of $1,200 for three months of work. Um, and I was in it, wrote music for it, and uh, designed the show, um, and um, also directed some little music videos. It got picked up for PBS. Uh, my deal was, since I wasn't making that much money, was that if it got picked up, that I could decide whether to go on with it or not. I did that for two seasons, and through that, met some Emmy award-winning producers and directors that had uh, some movies of the week back when they did those for um, CBS. And uh, they didn't have a designer for the next show. So I all of a sudden was doing my first movie. You know, you think you know what you're doing and, you, and instead you're just kind of learning by braille. Um, I, I quickly learned what I didn't know uh, that first project, I was the designer, location scout, stunt coordinator, greensman, and props master. And, um, you know, they did the wedding, I mean, the um, birthday scene, brought out, you know, we brought out the cake, cut the cake, and they said, okay, it's time for take two, where's the cake? And I didn't have a next cake because I had never thought about that. In theater, you have that one cake for the night. Uh, so I'm quickly, you know, dealing with the icing and heating up the knife and trying to make it look like nothing had been cut. But quickly you learn. And, and um, it was, uh, you know, a very fast trajectory. Uh, and each project got more and more uh, complicated and um, got my first feature. And then uh, I was the number three banana on that first feature, which was called Problem Child for Universal with John Ritter. And uh, they ended up firing the production designer and art director, and I continued designing that movie. And they had uh, three different groups of reshoots that we ended up doing, uh, including um, uh, a three ring circus that I had 12 days to put together with a backstage area and a midway. And after I pulled that off, those producers asked me to move to L.A. And I that's that's the impetus for getting to LA. Interesting. So how many years ago did you move to LA? I moved in, oh my goodness, it's gonna date me. Uh, <laughs> I moved in 94. Wow, okay, that's amazing. You know, right. so what most people don't understand is when they see street scenes and all this kind of thing and these giant homes and everything, they think that you just move into that space. You move into a police department, you move into a school, you move into these places, but you really are not doing that at all. Like it, well, it's very rare. One of the things that happens, uh, a script is basically like an outline. A script is 120 pages, a uh, page is about a, uh, a minute. So that's kind of an average, uh, a two hour movie, 120 pages of outline. And it will say upscale lawyer's office or uh, backstage Broadway or whatever it says in the script. I have to, that's all there is. There might be a particular description that uh, uh, under the peeling wallpaper, he finds a note, uh, you know, something that, that obscure and that basic. Mm -hmm. So being, being one of the first people hired, I come through, break down the script and tell uh, folks based on either the locations that are required for that script or things, what should be built sets and what should be locations. Mm -hmm. And we then start looking for either because of tax credits, you go to a particular place or because of the types of locations. Um, back in uh, like 2007, 2008, I did a movie called The Express about Ernie Davis, the mm -hmm. first black winner of the Heisman Trophy. And he was from Syracuse University, but Syracuse doesn't look like it did. And we needed a lot of football stadiums and a lot of locker rooms and things. So we went to Chicago because it had a lot of historic buildings and then figured out 
how to use Northwestern's stadium by changing the environments, doing uh, a different tunnel and different walls and things, how to make it be multiple uh, football fields. Um, so you have to become the expert in whatever the subject matter is. You have to also be a logistician, as it were. How do we film it? How does it actually work? if it has to collapse, if it has to explode. Uh, so it's not about just making pretty environments. It's actually, how do they pro uh, propel the story? Mm -hmm. So it's not, not just architecture. The walls have to be able to move so a camera can get in, or you have to have safety considerations. On the movie Flight, when we were figuring out how to flip a plane upside down and film inside, you know, it's multiple rigs and, you have to figure out how long, what kind of rig you need, how long does it take to install that rig? And then when you're installing, where else can you be filming while we're changing things out with the different rigs of something? Mm -hmm. So each movie has its own language and each movie has its own complexities that you have to uh, uh, address. One of the most amazing things I find about you is the amount of research you do as you jump into a movie. Like, for instance, you were talking about In the Heights and, and the research you did for that neighborhood that no longer exists anymore. I mean, that is just amazing to me. So when you when you go to an area and you start doing your research, like what is it that I mean, you're making cans with labels on them. <laughs> you're finding all this, you're, you're finding all this nicky nacky stuff and you're going back to the books and you're looking up the historical references. It's so amazing to me that you actually spend that kind of time doing it to make it that realistic. So what would you say would be like one of the most challenging research projects you had to do? Well, I mean, they all have specific needs that are, that are very different, like runaway jury, uh, Louisiana is the only state that has Napoleonic law. So how are you going to structure a court case and create those environments that feel real and are also workable for, for your crew and for your cast? Um, in the Heights, since you mentioned that, uh, you have uh, the Washington Heights area of uh, Manhattan, which is the very top of the island. Um, and there's uh, it's right next to the Bronx and just below Inwood. So part of my research was literally walking every street of uh, Washington Heights and the little area of Inwood and about half of the Bronx, taking copious photographs of uh, the types of locations or the types of uh, environments that I wanted to create for the movie. Um, so I spent about three days doing that uh, and then, you know, cataloging salons and bodegas and uh, apartments and, you know, you name it, uh, the little tiny uh, flourishes that you would only see there. What makes a bodega in the Bronx different than Washington Heights? I also, whatever city I'm in, uh, whether it was New Orleans for, let's say, Runaway Jury, there's the historic New Orleans collection, which is a cataloging that started in the uh, in the uh, WPA era of each building in the French Quarter. And I just spent just copious amounts of time going through boxes, looking at photographs of what had happened to each of the buildings, looking at artists that uh, worked in, in each uh, of the, the um, uh, areas of New Orleans and finding um, uh, in, you know, endemic art uh, and artists to incorporate in the designs of the movie. Basically, when you're scouting and when you're doing your research, you're finding the movie more so than just reading a script. Um, so on the, in the Heights, uh, there is a room called Room 100 uh, in Bryant Park at the main library in New York. And it's filled with clippings from magazines, uh, just, uh, it's huge. And they're all cataloged by subject matter. So I went through and looked at anything from the Dominican Republic, anything from Puerto Rico, anything from Washington Heights, and spent two days photographing images from the 70s and forward, trying to give a flavor, again, of photographic images that might then spur how we choose to photograph what we have. And then after you've done all this research, I create a big room with walls that have things in approximate order of the script. Uh, with all of those uh, research materials so that uh, we can uh, discuss with the director um, and often with the actors uh, the look 
uh, and the the creative visual arc of the story, just as an actor would do an arc with their characterization, I do a visual arc. Mm -hmm. And you're able to see it when it's, you know, people go, oh, we can do that on the computer. Well, yes, you can, but the more images you have, just like today in Zoom, the more people you have, the smaller each image gets, and it's hard to compare and contrast. And so by having a, a big room just dedicated to this, you're able to put fabrics, you're able to put uh, your your photographic reference, you're able to put drawings as you start developing the drawings. And a director can at any time walk through and see, and there are no good surprises in movie making. You want to be meticulously planned and meticulously ahead of the ball. Mm -hmm. And so I find if it's on your computer, it's yours and it's kind of collected and, and it's not there to see, but people can absorb the colors and the paint chips and the fabrics when they're out and they're walking by them every day. And, and it just helps keep everybody on the same page. Uh, and also as things change, you're able to quickly do it and put, put things up side by side and make decisions that way. And then as you choose a location, you're putting those location pictures up as well. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about location because, you know, when you did Crazy Rich Asians and were working with the author from that book, you were looking for the most opulent that you could find in that whole area. It must have been the most interesting field trip for you to decide where you were going to film, because I know you did some over in Malaysia, you did some over here. I mean, what made you decide on the locations? What makes you decide, OK, this is where we're going to be? <laughs> well, sometimes sometimes a location just jumps out and you you know oh this this kind of makes sense we knew we needed to film in singapore where the whole story takes place but singapore is exhaustively expensive and we knew we had to put up uh in hotels uh, or apartments all of our cast and crew and it was really really um almost cost prohibitive for the small budget that that we had for that movie so our early meetings were all about what country we should uh, be in, whether we should be in Thailand or Malaysia, because they both have film communities, um, but uh, limiting our work in Singapore to just the things that were, were really required. Mm -hmm. So we went through everything and found, found we only needed 10 days of things in Singapore per se. And then it was a matter of scouting and finding you know, elements of each of those cities uh, in Malaysia and Bangkok, well, the whole Bangkok region, about an hour in, in circumference around, um, and ultimately weighing what we could and couldn't do at each of those places. And um, the options for Terrasol Park, which is the main house, we just didn't have any good options in Thailand. So mm -hmm. that kind of drove the decision because that's such an important uh, location for Crazy Rich Asians. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh there again the house wasn't a house that you know you think oh my gosh that you see in the movie and it's so pretty um it instead was two different houses that had been built in the 1880s uh as the governor's residence and the guest house uh for the british uh governor of malaysia later had it become a boutique hotel and then uh, about 12 years prior to our being there, the Malaysian government kicked the hotel out thinking they could come up with a better use for these two houses. Uh, they sat in basically in the jungle in the heat uh, for 12 years open. And when we got to them, there were sections of the exteriors that were rotting. Uh, there um, was no electricity in either building. Um, the kitchens had been gutted and turned into commercial kitchens, but they were beyond use. And so we chose one of those as the exterior of the house. And I built scenery to cover the rotting pieces and did temporary electrical in and put a vestibule on the front of it. So a double set of double doors so that you could go in and you're seeing the next set of doors and then um, did the whole front landscaping and all of that. And then the interior of the house, which was about a half mile away, uh, had collapsed floors and feral dogs living underneath it. And every time he went to scout it, bats would swoop. John Chu would send me first. And I'm like, I fell for that again as the bats are coming at me. And uh, then um, uh, we had uh, 
monkey poo on everything. So we had to sterilize that. It had there were great bones to the house. Otherwise, we wouldn't have this gone. This is why I'm asking. I mean, why would you choose that? I mean, okay. First of all, if anyone is wondering, this is the giant. This is the grandmother's giant estate, right? The big oasis, Terrace Park. Yes, right. where she goes and meets his family for the first time. Right. right. Okay. So, so why would you insist on using something like that when you've got to clear out the monkey poo? You got to clear out. All this well, stuff? because you want to have inside and outside connections with windows and things that, uh -huh. and there was really no stage space in Malaysia to be able to build the interiors. So you, you, you look for the assets that are going to best serve what you need and you build upon those. And in this case, there was this grand staircase that was like, oh my gosh, that's going to be iconic even though it was a mess. There was rotting uh, red carpet over everything. Um, so the first thing we did was just strip, strip things out and, and to see what we had. And then I love to do subtle or not so subtle things to stories um, besides building then a second vestibule on the interior so that you see, and it feels like you're just walking into the same house. Um, the whole staircase area is wallpapered in William Morris wallpaper, which uh, for those who know is a turn of the century uh, historic wallpaper from uh, the UK that uh, really in a way represents colonialism. And so there was uh, this old opulent uh, feeling that this house had been there since it had been a British colony right. uh, and, and a vestige of your oppressor, as it were, uh, for the, the Singaporeans. Um, and, uh, you know, we gold gilded, uh, fake gold gilding <laughs> the uh, handrails and painted the whole thing and stripped the carpets out and found uh, just a horrible like black gunk that as we stripped it, we found that there were herringbone floors underneath. And so you find surprises and you learn either to embrace them or you have to, you know, spend money to, you know, hide them. But really, with the interior and ex uh, exterior, we still had other parts of the house. We needed the son's bedroom, Henry Golding's bedroom. Uh, that's an entire set uh, built from scratch. The kitchen, uh, the kitchen's actually done in a um, museum in downtown Kuala Lumpur. They had a living room that was the right size space. And then I designed kitchen benches and working areas and, and a stenciled floor to look like the Peranakan tile on the floor um, and uh, stained glass elements that then would link it back to the house um, because there was no place, there were no stages and no other place to build that uh, kitchen. Right. That kitchen was the very first element we filmed in the movie that the actors saw of Terrasal Park. And Michelle Yeoh came in my first time to meet her. Um, and she looked around and she goes, you, you got it right. How did you do that? And like, I was sweating meeting her because she's from Ipo, Malaysia. She knows all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, former Miss Universe, a Bond girl. She's major. And, you know, I said, well, I, I was in all the night markets doing photographing all the food and then working with a food stylist to say, does that only come in brown or is there another way to do that? items so that it, it looks a little bit more luxe. So we created all this food coming in and out of the party and immediately the actors knew we, they had to step up their game because the show was visually going to look this. So they had to do that as well. Okay. Um, I have to ask you the funny story about the big ring. How did you get a hold of that big ring? Oh, well, we were designing this ring that became the engagement ring. Yeah. In occasions. We were, we were actually designing various things and the director had all these ideas that we kept doing concepts for and they looked garish and they did i mean it didn't look old school I mean, we just were struggling with that and uh, michelle uh came in and looked at, at what we had uh mocked up and she goes ah oh, let me bring some things from home and you're like what because <laughs> for movies we always plan for the worst you know something's going to get broken something's going to get lost so you always have multiples of your hero props and a piece of jewelry like that is so incredibly important to have multiples of, but that's a real emerald and it's a one of, and we were guarding that like crazy. Um, there were a lot of things on that movie set uh, that we had real, like the jewelry store you go into with Astrid at the beginning is actually the St. Regis bar. 
Um, and I stripped out all the bar elements and brought in showcases and art and different furniture. Um, and the um, uh, high-end vault is their wine cellar. And we took out all the wine, had to work with the St. Regis to get uh, you know temperature control for all their wine collection, uh, and then created velvet shells for jewelry. We had over $3 million of real jewelry on that set and about $2 million of fake. And right beyond frame actually had guards uh, taking the jewelry away the minute we finished filming each night. Uh, and, uh, in fact, the last night they were like, the vault closes at five. We're taking her, her huge earrings. It's like, they're going, they're going into the vault now. And we, had to, <laughs> we had to work around the jewelry. I've never had to do that before. <laughs> you know, that's so interesting. So, uh, when you, do you just like walk through streets, walk through buildings and go, oh, what if I did it like that? I mean, how is it that you come up with an idea, you see a St. Regis bar and you're like, oh, I'm going to make this into a jewelry store. Oh, we how were, did your mind we work were, that way? We were struggling because um, in Malaysia and Singapore, it is so incredibly hot and humid that uh, people actually do go to the malls uh, there. Uh, because they're so air conditioned and there's high end uh, eateries and high end jewelry stores and all of the high end jewelry stores in both countries were in malls. There were no standalones. Wow. And, and we really wanted this to look luxe because an American audience looking at a jewelry store in a mall isn't going to think the same thing as it's standalone, like a storefront. Um, we went to De Beers and Tiffany's and all of these people wanted to design the ring. They wanted to be involved. And yet um, their, their spaces just didn't look luxe enough. So I immediately started going to all the high end hotels anywhere, trying to see event spaces that I could turn into something. And um, we were not allowed to go to the St. Regis uh, at first because um, the King of Jordan was there with 1800 entourage. Uh, in the other hotels around, and he was there for a month. So wow. the minute he, minute he left, we were looking for apartments, and we got up and looked at the high end spaces, and they had bulletproof glass. We don't think about needing that sort of thing, but the high end suites there, you see the windows, then there's drapes, and then there's bulletproof glass because they want to prove to you that they have it safe uh, for all of these heads of state. So as we were leaving that, because those apartments didn't work, we're going down and I saw the doors closed to the bar and I said, what is that? And uh, they said, well, it's the Astor uh, bar. And like, is there any way I can go in? They let me go in. And immediately I was like, it's the jewelry store. And everyone with me thought I had lost my marbles um, because it looked like a bar. Um, but I live in the world of possibility thinking. Um, it's it's you know, someone may see a, a, a red sheet, I, I see a dress, you know, or someone sees, you know, it, I have to see how anything and everything can be useful in telling a story and also staying within a budget and staying within a schedule. Right, exactly. You know, it's interesting that you brought up the wedding uh, because uh, how, okay, so if anyone is not familiar with the Crazy Rich Asians wedding scene, it is one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen in film. And what I find the most interesting in your story was how you and John Chu kind of came up with that idea because he started thinking water and you're trying to figure it out and how quickly you had to work to put it together and how and how you were so, I don't want to give away the story, but how you were so pressed to get it done before the filming began. Right. So you just kind of walk well, into that short little story. One of the things that happens, as I said a little earlier, you're kind of finding the movie when you're scouting, you're, you're getting inspiration, you're getting ideas. And, um, you know, you may have just been on a different subject matter doing a different project that was radically different, you know, right before you're onto this. So the minute you start, you're trying to change gears and, and be all in. So uh, ironically, what had happened is I met John and uh, the producer at John's house and then didn't hear anything. And it got to be Thanksgiving and, and right uh, after Thanksgiving, I got a call and said, we, you know, you have a meeting. Ran, oh, I'm sorry. It was the day before Thanksgiving. Um, and I always do my best. I know COVID is a whole different thing, uh, but I always do my best to meet in person. So they get my energy. So they get 
my ideas and, and just excitement and just get me because they're not just getting ideas. They're getting me. I'm going to be in the car with them. I'm going to be right by their side for six months or, or more. Um, they were willing to do a Zoom meeting before anybody else was really doing Zoom. And uh, uh, I said, no, no, I will change my plans to make sure that I can meet in person. I met in person and didn't hear uh, for a couple of weeks. And I thought, oh, maybe they did something else, went another direction. And then I get a call from my agents and um, uh, they're like, can you be on a plane tonight? Uh, and I went, yes. Uh, so I jumped on. I going? Uh, and, and they said, you're, you're going to, John is already over in Singapore. The uh, producers are in Thailand and they're going to come to meet you in Singapore. Uh, but the Warner travel person isn't, he's in the plane at the, in a plane at the moment. So just be prepared for a car to pick you up at seven and we'll get your tickets to you somehow. So I race up and I'm packing for a scouting trip and I, you know, get in the car to go to LAX and I still don't have a ticket. When we get to LAX, a ticket and uh, my whole schedule just popped up on my phone. I was just like, you, you have to trust and you go. I flew 26 hours, met John uh, and we started scouting. We finished a little bit in Singapore, flew up to Bangkok. When we were in Bangkok, we went to a hotel that had a, um, a large atrium in the back section of the hotel and a raised water feature with traveler's palms. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and said, are you thinking what I'm thinking? I went, I think I am thinking what you're thinking. And we're like, could we do the wedding here? They'd done a, some fashion shows there. It was very shallow water, but we knew immediately that water had to be involved. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately, um, and we liked these travelers palms, these huge, gorgeous uh, palms. And, um, so we ticked that box. That's what we wanted. We knew that was going to happen, but we knew now that we weren't going to shoot in Thailand. And then another idea John had, he said, well, you know, I kept thinking that Singapore is so excited about their botanicals and they have a UNESCO world heritage site, orchid gardens and the gardens by the bay and all this. And, and if you're really, really wealthy, you would surprise people by maybe doing a garden indoors, uh, but still keeping to that strict church wedding idea. Right. So he said, maybe we do a huge meadow and, you know, a big ramped meadow and, and, I said, well, ladies are in high heels and you sink into you sink into dirt. So maybe uh, let me figure this out. And so we started looking all over the world for grasses and real grasses, of course, go limp. And then artificial ones look super fake. And so it was about developing a system to hold uh, the grasses, which are about three feet tall and creating a seating system. And how can you film in that space? So we chose uh, Chimes, which is the ch uh, Church of the Holy Infant Jesus uh, uh, Episcopal School. And now it's deconsecrated and it's in the middle of a, of a shopping complex and used as an event venue. Mm -hmm. It was only available for four and a half days because it's so booked in advance for weddings and events. Mm -hmm. So our shooting whole shooting schedule then flipped to being Malaysia first, Singapore last, so that we could capture those four and a half days, wow. which meant that I was going to have a very limited window to install. So I designed one meter by one meter green pegboards, and we chose the, the size of the holes and their spacing so that we could hold these grasses and then install those on the floor pretty quickly. And then if you're filming and you need a crane or a, um, uh, any equipment to come through, you can just pull the grasses out of the pegboard and drive around on the pegboard and then pop it back in. Okay. And then the benches were designed with uh, a green velvet kidney shape type something that uh, had screw in legs because we had to be able to get these through doors and assemble things quickly. And we didn't want backs. Mm -hmm. Also, I pitched to John that most Chinese gardens have a moon gate. And so he liked that idea. I did renderings of that. And uh, we prefabbed a moon gate in pieces that then we could install. I had 26 hours to install all the greens and all the flora, you know, literally make the wedding from scratch, as well as lift all their chandeliers out of the way. And the bigger challenge was the water feature. And as we had been talking about this, we were like, it 
it should be a water aisle because brides walk on water. And it's just a nice little symbolism idea. Um, they had cast the actress to play um, uh, Arminta, the bride, uh, and she was a dancer. And of course, when I told the costume designer that we were going to have water flood down the aisle and she's doing a wedding dress, you know, her eyes bugged out. And she was like, oh, what? So it's almost a neoprene type material because you wanted it to be able to shed the water and look beautiful still. Um, we literally did not have time to test the water feature and all the jets are hidden in the water and everything was installed, but the, the aisle is so long that it had to be uh, in uh, semi-trailers in pieces and we had to waterproof and do all of this work. So we did as much as we could prior everything loaded in. It was like going to battle. You know, these things come in first, these things come in next. Uh, we had two semis filled with uh, greens and two semis filled with uh, the scenery. And um, it, we installed in 26 hours. Then we started a rehearsal and then uh, we shot for a day and a half. And then that night after a day and a half of filming, uh, the last thing to shoot was the water because we knew that if it if it didn't work, we would be in trouble. So we scheduled things for the water to last. And I ran over to John when we were ready to do this and we grabbed hands and we crossed our other fingers and we were like, start the pumps. And it worked the first time. And uh, we had uh, uh, vax to get uh, up the water. And uh, then we did it two more times and then flooded the aisle. And the you see the high angle shot with all the, all the bridesmaids walking through the water. Then all of that had to come out through the only doors that would fit everything where we were filming the very next morning for a half a day of the whole arrival to the, to the uh, wedding reception, I mean, to the wedding. Um, and the crazy thing for all of you on this call is that you're not doing one thing in isolation. While you're doing one thing, you're actually building and installing other things. And the wedding reception was being installed at Gardens by the Bay. Um, and just where we wanted to put that reception was where they had planned their fifth year anniversary with the prime minister. And we had to convince them not to boot us out of the gardens. So I had to redesign all the set pieces on wheels so that they could move out of the way uh, uh, when we filmed overnight and then during the day so they could have their events and then we'd roll them back in and redress it. So you're, you're literally, you, 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 there's no such thing as procrastination. You have to be super planned and super on top of it so that things are happening. There, there is no, I'm sorry if the shooting company shows up and the set's not ready. Right. right. Uh, once the trains left the station, it is just, it is crazy fast and crazy insane. Uh, especially when you're in one set per day, you know, sometimes. I remember you telling me that you and your team would be working until the people started walking on the set in the morning to start. Yeah. You'd be putting up wallpaper. You'd be doing all the stuff, you know, to make it work. Yeah. The so crazy rich Asians. One of those things was the, the plane. Uh, mm -hmm. We, we did not get Singapore airlines. And so I got to make up my own airlines and we built that as a set mm -hmm. and we're installing uh, at a university, uh, basically gym space and the graphics that we had designed for all of the high end cabin walls showed up and the color didn't match. And so they were having to print all night. And as they were printing things, we were installing and literally the director came in and was blocking as we were putting in the last piece of furniture. It, that's a little too much, but, but it does happen. You have to keep your wits around you. You know, that's an interesting thing that you said about Singapore Airlines. I don't even know what time we are at because this is so fascinating. Okay, we, we've got about 10 more minutes. Um, you had talked about the fact that Singapore Airlines didn't want to participate and they lost this giant opportunity because no one knew that Crazy Rich Asians was going to be that big. But I know that you go in with the expectation that they're going to say yes. Like the giant pool that's on top in Singapore, that had never been filmed in before, right? Right, right. Um I, how, how do you have I this attitude where you're just like, okay, let's just go ask? <laughs> uh, you have to believe and you have to present it in such a way with confidence that that people understand that you're going to uh, actually do what you say. Uh, being a person of your word is so incredibly important. Always leave things better than you found them. Um, it's uh, it's super important. Uh, and I remember 
when you did the in the heights pool you know that you left much better than you oh, found right yeah but, but you know people had always been or i should say uh asian culture uh predominantly has been maligned in hollywood and so you have a movie called crazy rich asians even though it's an international bestseller and people are like uh i don't know squish face i don't know and we kept trying to explain to Singapore Air how great this was going to be, how it was going to be the perfect marketing opportunity. And um, uh, we tried for like five months to get them to say yes. And, you know, ultimately created our own. You have to, I deal with legal. I didn't even mention that. Anything that's copyrighted, anything that's showing up uh, that uh, whether it's a poster or a name of a place, I have to go through legal clearance and create, uh, have legal look at our logos and things that we create. So I came up with China ASEAN Airlines or Pacific ASEAN Airlines and um, a beautiful logo and did all this Wow! Uh, because they missed a, a huge worldwide uh, opportunity. Right. So I know that there's talk of the second one. Have they signed in for that? <laughs> <laughs> Well, now, I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens. We were hoping to shoot number two, and number three at the same time, like I did the two Fifty Shades sequels, because all the cast have blown up so huge now. We need to be able to uh, get everybody in the same place at the same time. Um, and they're still working on the scripts because we want the first one was such a big success. You want to make sure that uh, you're setting yourself up for success with the uh, additionals. Absolutely. Um, so when you are, let me ask you, when you, First of all, just tell me quickly what you think the most challenging thing was. Like you were trying to make it work, trying to make it work, trying to make it work. And is it is it because of the mechanics of it or is it because of the communication that you have with the team to try to get this dream into the reality? Where do you find that challenge happening? Does it happen because the mechanics are just not working? The schedule isn't working? Or is it the team and communicating with them what that dream is in your head? Um, I try to over communicate. I try to make sure that everybody not only is seeing the walls that we're talking about every element of it. Uh, I think the biggest challenges now are uh, scheduling where things are super condensed or where you're doing something that no one has really done quite before, such as the dancing wall and in the heights, mm -hmm. uh, uh, where you actually don't know for sure if it's going to work. Uh, because it's, is it going to look hokey? Is it going to, uh, you know, actually uh, propel and make the scene stronger? Um, and so you try to do testing and you do models, you do anything that you can do, whether it's in the computer or physical to uh, work through those challenges and problems so that you know that uh, it's going to be successful as it goes forward. So for the dancing wall, we actually, as I was designing, the 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 building we taped everything out uh in a dance floor and put sensors on other dancers not the actors and had storyboarded the sequence and filmed them doing things and then put the storyboards behind to see if we could get those angles and would it actually look silly or would it look magical and it actually that little animatic worked and was so magical that uh, the studio was like, we have to do this. And so, you know, you go forward. Uh, the airplane in flight, I mean, you're sitting there with studio lawyers on calls with Robert Zemeckis and, and, and myself and about 12 lawyers. And they're saying, oh, you can't put actors upside down because we'll have legal problems. Uh, and we're like, uh, well, they're strapped in and it's the plane is not that huge. Uh, I mean, even when you're sitting normally in a plane, you can touch the underneath side of the uh, uh, carriage compartments. And uh, they were like, well, no, we're actually rethinking um, uh, even having kids on horses. And so you have to actually have all stunt players uh, for just your general population in the airline. So that's more expensive. But we had to actually put stunt players in for all of the elements where we're flipping people. And they're right. like, well, we're going to have to put all these things in and and all and like, well, actually, the lap belt on a stunt player is all they need, you know, so right. um, you have to demonstrate things uh, to various gatekeepers for them to like actually say yes. Wow. Absolutely amazing. Did So let me ask you, when you design something and you spend three days filming it, i.e. the bachelor party on the ship in the middle of the ocean 
and 20 seconds of it or a minute and a half, how many, how much of that filming ended up in the movie? Well, we, uh, first off the, the bachelor party, it's supposed to be, it's written in the book on a yacht. And right. I just done the 250 shade sequels and uh, even the most luxurious yachts don't have big spaces in them. And so they don't look as luxurious when you're in them. Uh, and we needed the big bang of something that a big wow factor. Every time we flew into uh, Singapore, there were 80 to 120 container ships waiting to come into port. And I looked at John, one of those trips, and he looked at me, he goes, are you thinking what I'm thinking? I'm like, I think I am thinking what you're thinking. Let's put it on a container ship. Well, we actually didn't film on a container ship. We built the uh, container ship look on a parking lot and then added in the elements that we needed, uh, like the conning tower and all of that beyond. Uh, but it had to have a helicopter land on it, which is not in the movie. Um, and so we had to deal with their equivalent of the FAA and structural engineers to make sure that we didn't have anything that would fly away uh, near the helicopter's rotors um, because you're dealing with safety, et cetera. And that's three stories high. Um, and we had a whole, other than the arrival scene, there's a whole sequence that happens during the day. Well, in the assembly of the movie, we realized that the movie was way too long. And what do you, you know, what will audience uh, members like sit through? What can you do without and still get the same story? And we realized that once you arrive, that we can just immediately do a little something, which you see the little flare gun go off and you go into the night scenes and you realize, oh, they've been there all day. And now this is the crazy meat of the story, which is at night. And you, you, even though all of them are your children, all of your your great ideas and your sets of things, you also have to be willing to let go because um, if every bit of it is great, then it doesn't matter if something goes away because it still will look great. I love, yeah, I love this end of the business because I don't have to worry about performance. I know after something is built and as we're shooting it, I know what it looks like. So if I can make sure all of the parts look great, then when it's all put together, at least we're going to have a great looking movie and hopefully it's a good movie as well. You know, and I love to use, I love to use artists and things that would actually propel the story. And, and, um, uh, and since uh, my heart is in Laguna beach, uh, you know, I, I always am trying to get uh, Laguna artists featured uh, in, or Laguna gallerists uh, clients featured in, in pieces. And uh, that's been a fun uh, a fun little side story as well. I, you know, there's in, in the Heights, there's Puerto Rican art, there's Cuban art, and there's Dominican art. Uh, even the, the uh, map that's behind the counter and in the Heights is made from all of the pieces uh, of product that are sold in the bodega. And it's an original piece, even with sand from the DR and lotto tickets and Metro cards and things. It's so specific. And then you wipe the slate clean and you start on the next thing and make it the best it can possibly be. Wow. I just love it. I was watching, um, I know we've got to wrap up here. I was watching your 10 things on YouTube, <laughs> 10 things about Nelson Coates that you probably don't know. And they asked the question, um, what would you tell yourself if you were 10, like if you're looking back at yourself 10 years ago, what would you tell yourself? What would you give the best advice to? What would you say there? Um, I would say uh, don't uh, don't put the brakes on your ideas. Uh, you know, go for it. You know, go go further and farther and faster than you're dreaming. You know, dream bigger. That's that's what I would tell myself. I absolutely uh, love it. Absolutely love it. This has just been, this has been amazing. I think we're at, we're right at the hour. So folks, I'm afraid we don't have time for questions because we've got to let Nelson get back to creating Hocus Pocus 2. We'll never have the movie if he's not there. <laughs> this has been absolutely fantastic. This has just been so uplifting. I so appreciate you, Nelson, and the talent and your skill and your brain is so incredible. So really, thank you so much. And I hope we can have you back sometime soon. And folks, if you have any questions, you can certainly send them to me and maybe I'll just, you know, pelt him with questions after this so that we can get some more answers out of Nelson. And but sometimes they, watch something with the sound off and just pay attention to the story that is the visual. And you'll see how hard all those crew members are doing 
uh, to tell that story and make a sense of place and a sense of time that you haven't seen before. And it's, it's a really fun way to uh, watch shows. I absolutely love that. Thank you so much, Nelson. We'll let you get back to your set and you have a great day. And everybody, thank you so much for being on this call and we'll get the recorded call to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.